Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alondra Nelson. I'm president of the Social Science Research Council and professor of sociology at the Institute for Advanced Study. I am delighted to welcome you to this very critical conversation on race and vulnerable populations at the, in the intersection with COVID-19. Um, just as the virus exacerbated existing uh, pre-existing medical conditions in individual bodies, the pandemic exploited and aggravated pre-existing structural weaknesses, um, producing high vulnerability among uh, large swaths of our communities, including essential workers, racial and ethnic minorities, the poor rural communities, uh, and others. Um, and there's been in recent years a, a growing dialogue about inequality, um, but we might say we might say that a, a silver lining about the pandemic has been a kind of heightened recognition of the both the origins and the consequences for life and death of this inequality, um, what it uh, you know and its intersections with racism and discrimination. We're uh, coming to have a growing awareness, um, in particular, of the systematic natures of inequality, including racism, and the persistence of these forms of inequality uh, and their dire consequences globally. Uh, so this is a, you know, a crisis within a crisis, or indeed a crisis that begat a crisis. Um, so this afternoon, I'm pleased to be in conversation with leading researchers and advocates about how about their diagnoses of the myriad forms of inequality that have been laid bare and exacerbated by this pandemic, and how we can realign and indeed reimagine systems to support those most in need. So let me begin by introducing briefly today's distinguished lineup of speakers. Uh, Kimberly Teehee is the Cherokee Nation's delegate to Congress. Director of Government Relations for, Cher for the Cherokee Nation and Senior Vice President of Government Relations for Cherokee Nation Businesses. Dr. Leandris Liburd is Associate Director for Minority Health and Health Equity at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States. Dr. Kamara Jones is Senior Fellow at the Morehouse School of Medicine and former President of the American Public Health Association, as well as being a practicing family physician and epidemiologist. David Miliband is President and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. And Mary Kay Henry is the International President of the Service Employees International Union. Thank you all very much for being here. So we're running a little bit um, uh, late uh, with our timing. And so we're gonna start with Dr. Jones because um, I know that she's got to uh, depart uh, first. So, so let's begin with you, um, Dr. Jones, about this issue of pre-existing conditions. Um, so much of your, your life's work and indeed um, the urgent work that you've been doing more recently around COVID-19 has been helping us to think about pre-existing conditions and about the systemic nature of um, inequalities that produce forms of health inequality. So I wanted you to, to say a, a little bit about, um, um, about how you think about health inequality, it's, its sort of origins, and, and also to take a moment to uh, help us to reimagine um, what we might, to think about what we might do about it. What should we be looking for, or where, what levers do we have um, for solutions? Well, thank you for that question. and. It's important for us to recognize that uh, racial health disparities in terms of who has diabetes and who is you know, overweight and has heart disease and all of those things, which we're now calling the pre-existing conditions that are making it more likely that if you get COVID, you'll die, that those don't just happen. It's also not, doesn't just so happen, for example, that Black, brown, and indigenous people are in more of the frontline jobs, more of the essential workforce that's not essential enough to protect, just essential enough 
to put into harm's way and maybe a little disposable. It doesn't just so happen. These, the differential distribution of the social determinants of health, that's not just a happenstance. And what COVID did, again, which has been done by Hurricane Katrina, has been done by you know the Flint water crisis, was pull the sheets back on structural racism. And we have to be uh, unafraid to say the word racism and to understand that it is a system of structuring opportunity and of assigning value based on so-called race. And that this system is what makes, you know, COVID-19 is showing up, you know, with differential impact on communities of color. If we don't un dismantle racism, then COVID-23 will show up in the same way. And we keep being reminded that racism exists in fleeting ways, but then racism denial in this country is so, staunchly held and so seductive that even all of the people right now who joined in in protest and mobilizations after the murder of Mr. George Floyd, who are naming racism now, if we don't move into action, then we might fall in another six months or so into what I describe as the somnolence of racism denial. So what we need to do is not just work on the social determinants of health. We need to figure out why uh, is housing distributed differently by race? Why is educational opportunities and, and uh, environmental toxins? And why are these things differentially distributed by race? And then we need to get to the deep, deep cause of racism. And we need to dismantle the structures and we need to combat white supremacist ideology, which is a false idea of differential valuation of human life by race with white people at the top. There is no such thing as differential you know, valuation by race. There's no such thing as race. We need to address these things head on. Um, I could talk for a long time, so I'm gonna let you ask me another question about like the specifics. Um, yes, please. So I'm mindful that we, we don't have a, a full time with you. I would love to, to hear you talk about um, some responses, you know, what, 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 what might we do? And I think, you know, you raised George Floyd, um, uh, the murder of an African-American man here in the United States. Uh, and then more recently we have January 6th. And so here we have, uh, you know, half a year um, of uh, demonstration that it's not just COVID, that COVID is really a kind of symptom of these kind of larger issues that you were talking about. So, um, you know, the thing about COVID, uh, even though we're struggling with it in many of our communities, is that we think we can get a handle on it, right? We think we can have a vaccine and, and, and do something about it. What's hard about your um, incisive, you know, diagnosis of systemic racism is that it is a big and long problem. Um, a vaccine's not even going to begin to fix it. So how do we begin to think about um, uh, some of the, the sort of things that we can begin to do, understanding that this is... Uh, uh, the work of, of, it's not impossible work, but it is a work that's going to take some time. Well, it's work that requires uh, focus. It's work that requires a sense of urgency, but an understanding that it's a long-term effort, right? And it's work that requires coordination. There are three steps, three tasks. We need to all as a nation name racism. We need to be able to say the word because if we don't say the word racism in the context of our widespread denial, then we're complicit with that denial. But the things we need to understand about racism are that yes, racism exists, that racism is a system. So when we say the word racism, we're not trying to divide a room into who's racist and who's not. We are talking about a system. Yes, that racism saps the strength of the whole society. It unfairly disadvantages some, it unfairly advantages others, but because of the waste in human potential and human resources, it is sapping the strength of the whole society. And yes, we can act to dismantle it. How do we move to action? First step, naming racism, but then moving to action requires looking at all of our systems, asking the question, how is racism operating here? Not even is racism operating here? Yes, racism is foundational in our nation's history, continues to exist and have profoundly negative impacts on the health and well-being of the whole nation. How is racism operating here? And you answer that question by looking at different elements of decision-making. You look at who's at the decision-making table and who's not. The who, what, when, and where of decision-making is actually, these are our structures. Then you look at the how of decision-making, our written policies are the written how and the, the uh, unwritten how is in a 
in our practices and norms. And then you look at the values, the why of decision making. In other words, what I'm saying is you might say, oh, structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. That sounds highfalutin. How do I get a handle on that? Basically, the most important thing is who is at decision making tables? Who has the power and who does not? What is on the agenda and what is not? And then whose values are being brought to bear. We saw the devaluation of black, brown and indigenous life when it was first realized that there was a disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color. And that was exactly the time when the president said, liberate Minnesota, liberate Michigan, liberate Virginia, because he misunderstood and thought it was only going to impact people of color. And the devaluation and dehumanization of our lives is, uh, so how do we get there? We get there together. We get there naming racism. We must interrupt the intergenerational transmission of racism denial. We need to change our structures. We need to invest massively in communities of color around housing and green space. We need to uh, environmental cleanup, banks and businesses. We need to have reparations for to descendants of Africans enslaved in the US as well as full honoring of our treaties. We need to have decarceration, right? Um, of the, the, the way that we are disproportionately warehousing so many black and brown men in our prison system and in our detention centers, not recognizing that waste, the human potential that's been locked up. And we need to put strong supports around our children so that children will, that, this is how we'll know we've, we've succeeded. When the term disadvantaged child has no meaning because we won't even be able to imagine a child born into disadvantage or falling into disadvantage. And we do that by lots of tax, tax practices and full investment. So, I mean, we can go down the line, but the main thing is you need to ask first, how is racism operating here in my bank, in my city, in my child's school? What are the structures, policies, practices, norms, and values? And then you move to action. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. And um, we hope that you'll stay with us as long as possible because, because there's uh, much, uh, you said very many rich things that we should come back to. <laughs> so I'm gonna turn next to, to Dr. Liebert, um, who's Associate Director for Minority Health and Health Equity at the CDC, um, which among other things over this last uh, 10, 10 or 11 months has um, rolled out a COVID-19 response health equity strategy. Uh, so I wanted to um, give you an opportunity to say a little bit about what that is. I'm not sure that most of us are familiar with that. Um, and to uh, maybe talk about some of the, the um, issues that you see that we're facing with regards to the disproportionate burden of COVID-19 um, and, uh, and the challenges that, that remain for us in, in that, on that front. Yeah, so good afternoon and thank you, Dr. Nelson, for uh, the opportunity to be here with you and with the panel. Um, I do have the good fortune to serve as CDC's Chief Health Equity Officer uh, for the COVID-19 response. This was a role that I started um, in May of uh, 2020. Um, I rolled off for a few months and have returned actually just this past week. Um, we stood up um, a health equity strategy that was released um, in July of 2020. And there were four um, high level priorities that, that I will speak to. The first one was to um, expand the evidence base and that we wanted to be able to more fully understand what those factors were that were causing uh, the disproportionate burden of COVID-19 infection, uh, severe illness and hospitalization and even death um, in communities of color. And our second priority was to increase um, access to testing, to contact tracing, to um, isolation options when people were found to be positive, and also to increase access um, to health care um, during this crisis. And we wanted to focus those efforts um, in communities of color as well. Our third um, priority was really around um, increasing um, care and practices and protection to essential workers, um, not just um, healthcare workers, but essential workers, as has been described earlier today, um, people who are 
um, grocery store cashiers and restaurant workers, people who work on uh, in public transit and in, in construction, um, those people who do not have the option um, to work from home. We wanted to be sure to address um, that population. And then we had a fourth priority, which was more internal, which was ensuring that our COVID-19 workforce, that it was diverse and that it brought together people within the agency um, who not only had brought di different disciplinary perspectives, but also different um, life experiences. So we wanted to be sure um, that we captured diversity uh, within the response, given you know, the increasing diversity um, of our nation. And so that strategy, and you can get more information about it, more details, um, if you go to the CDC Health Equity website, and it really elaborates more of what we have discovered um, in this process. Some things that we um, could have anticipated and things that we've seen as um, Dr. Jones described in other um, public health emergencies. Um, but that's in essence, the CDC um, health equity strategy. Thank you for that, Dr. Liburd. Um, so often, you know, too often we think about uh, healthcare as treating individual patients and bodies only. Uh, and the CDC strategy, you know, part of, as a part of the, the pillars that you just um, uh, uh, articulated, um, talks about, and I'm quoting here, a holistic all of response approach. So I'm, I would love to hear from you um, how we can collectively approach systemic factors to save lives and the present and better prepare for future pandemics and other health crises. And, and more particularly, if you might be willing to weigh in on um, following Dr. Jones, kind of the role of, of systemic racism, uh, if we're to take a holistic all of response approach, approach um, how does one approach that system in particular? Sure, absolutely. So when we uh, coined the phrase an all of response approach, we were really uh, looking across um, the different task forces within the CDC COVID-19 incident management structure. And so, you know, we have task forces that are focused on um, data collection, that are focused on laboratory practices, that are focused on health systems and worker safety. I mean, there is a range of them. Um, there's one that we call the Community Interventions and Critical Populations Task Force. So there are a number of task forces that actually bring together every day about 2,000 CDC employees. And so what we uh, didn't want to happen was that the responsibility for addressing COVID disparities, for addressing uh, social inequities, um, and for addressing all of the factors that we that we understand to be driving this pandemic, that people would perceive that it would rest with the chief health equity officer. It needed to be um, integrated fully across all um, aspects of the response. And so that was our internal uh, organization. Um, but rightly, when we think in terms of the population, we need to have in all, um, in all of health equity, all of everyone participating and driving health equity through whatever our practices are, whatever our policies are, whatever our uh, programs are. And so that means that the work of public health is not adequate to achieve all of this, that we have to have multi-sectoral engagement. And we have to be able to work across those sectors um, that are making policy decisions and making practice decisions and making healthcare decisions. And so, um, you know, we understand that, um, as Dr. Jones says, that discrimination, including racism, exists even in those systems that are set up to protect health and well being. And part of um, the, what we call our guiding principles um, includes um, addressing those. Uh, we also work to engage um, what we consider to be 
uh, trusted community institutions and voices. Um, the work that we're doing around um, addressing uh, discrimination is largely uh, carried out through a series of, of different um, initiatives that we're engaged with in terms of working with our state and local tribal and territorial departments of public health. We're also working with um, national partners who have access to different parts of the public health and the healthcare system and even community institutions to be able to help uh, you know, both formulate a strategy that is locally driven and locally determined and then to move toward implementing those. So, you know, I have to say, you know, as a, as a federal agency, as a, a science um, and data driven agency, um, we have really focused a huge amount of our time on getting data, um, data that helps us to monitor trends in the pandemic, but also data that helps us to understand um, at a more state and local level, the drivers of the pandemic. And that's where the social factors actually come in. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Leibert, which also gives me a, a perfect segue um, for uh, uh, now posing a few questions and some conversation with Kimberly Teehee, um, in part because, you know, Dr. Leibert ends with uh, community and with trust. And, uh, you know, we know in our uh, in indigenous communities, there's been um, uh, some significant healthcare disparities, but the Cherokee Nation really has shown extraordinary leadership and I think an inspirational model for all of us to follow and pay attention to. So just a few examples, but I would love for you to say more about this. Um, uh, at a time when we didn't have clear guidelines for contact tracing, um, uh, the Cherokee Nation was implementing, uh, you know, a, a full program of um, indoor and outdoor mask mandating. Um, for example, um, you created a COVID dashboard early on that was collecting uh, the data that's so central to understanding uh, what's happening. Um, and uh, that, that, you know, even although uh, nationwide, only 1% of physicians are, are Native American, the Cherokee Nation, 27% of physicians there are tribally affiliated. And, and so it, it, there's a, a kind of interesting, you know, I think it's a, it's a, um, a best of times, worst of times story, but there's a lot to, to learn from the Cherokee Nation. You know, I think one, uh, one concerning thing, of course, is uh, that, that the loss of, of elders from COVID um, and the loss of, of potential language capacity. So that um, you know, uh, COVID uh, takes from us um, lives, but also, you know, cultural capacity as well. So I, I wanted, I would love to just you to spend a few moments talking about uh, your experience and your leadership in this space. Sure. Thank you so much for the question. And thank you so much for having us. And Chief Hoskins sends his regrets that he couldn't be here today. He did have an unavoidable conflict that came up. Um, first of all, I want to talk about his leadership. When we got word in late February, we didn't wait for us to be hit unprepared. You know, we instantly, uh, Chief Hoskin um, in February, uh, developed the Coronavirus Task Force, and they came up with uh, recommendations on what we needed to do. Chief Hoskin uh, said early on that he was going to be guided by science, compassion, and culture. And so that's really what has guided um, the actions that we took. You know, in March, you know, he sent everybody home and to work from home. We, um, you know, then later as things wore on, we started having people come back to the office in these uh, kind of rotating shifts so that we were limited the capacity. Um, we still have people who are 65 and over uh, working at home, solely working at home, as well as those with high, in, as part of the high risk categories um, too. And so, we instantly, when we saw gaps and we saw Congress enacting two laws before the CARES Act, we knew that we were in trouble because uh, we weren't receiving funds as a result of those first two uh, responses um, from Congress. And, uh, and we knew that we didn't have a lot of access to PPE. What we also saw happening in our communities is that um, groceries started flying off the shelves 
you know, what Chief Hoska knew needed to happen is that we needed to keep our elders safe. That's the culture piece. We take care of our elders and we value our culture and our language. And, um, and so we put plan, he put plans in place, a mask mandate. Um, uh, we shut down our schools, which led to no sports for our high school um, in the last semester. And um, we started an emergency food distribution program and where we had drive-through um, um, food that we delivered and all the communities, Cherokee Nation covers 14 communities and we, our reservation spans 7,000 square miles in Northeastern Oklahoma. We um, provided lunch, uh, drive-through lunch for our students so that they continue to have meals. We've served 114,000 Cherokee citizens meals. That's 7.1 million meals to be exact. We provided over 60,000 um, uh, ready-made meals to our elders too. But we didn't just do that too. We also had to make sure that our students had the ability to learn at home. Distance learning was huge. And so providing stipends and providing stipends to public schools because the majority of our students do attend public schools here in Northeastern Oklahoma and making sure that they had ac access to the tools they needed. We began um, deploying mobile um, Wi-Fi uh, hot, hotspot devices to communities where the priorities are our students. And, um, but we continued on with um, assisting our people with disabilities, with uh, our veterans, um, our elders who I mentioned earlier. But in addition to that, um, we also knew we needed to plan for the future. And so when we knew that our food source for our elders protein was skyrocketing in prices, um, it led to us um, uh, constructing a meat processing plant so that we can provide our citizens with the protein that they need to help them. Now that's a project underway, which we hope to have in this early, early part of this year um, online. But in addition to that, PPE. PPE was so scarce as we all know early on and uh, Cherokee Nation was the first tribe to actually receive a supply of PPE from the Strategic National Stockpile. They hadn't, um, we, we hadn't, tribes had not been able to access uh, directly um, PPE from them before. And even the forms, hopefully they've changed by now, but the forms we were filling out said state and local governments, um, but we were able to access those things. We also worked nationally with tribes all over the country and with national tribal organizations to um, educate Congress about the need to have direct access to funding, but also PPE and supplies. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what we're doing now. And so our hope is that uh, we won't, won't go unprepared ever again. Um, we still have, um, you know, in our, for all that we've done and all that we've done that's been good, it has been without criticism. I mean, we are a very structured in our response to COVID, but we don't live in a bubble. We're surrounded by communities in, in a state that does not have mass mandates, that they don't have enforcement of the mandates that do exist. Um, and, you know, and we have, you know, people who live off the reservation and have evening activities, their kids still play in sports. And so some of this is not without criticism, but chief is committed, our chief is committed to making sure that we're guided by science, uh, compassion and culture. So one of the things we also did, keeping the cultural piece alive here is who we are uniquely as a people. So we established a, 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 a Cherokee language hotline for our elders and those who speak just Cherokee. Um, even in our vaccine distribution plan, you know, CDC, Indian Health Service, nobody required us to have a plan that set forth certain, um, certain way in which we're going to distribute our vaccine. There were recommendations. And so we value our Cherokee first language speakers. And we made sure that those speakers along with our healthcare providers were among the first to receive the vaccines. Now we have about 2000 Cherokee language first, first language speakers. We actually, a few years ago, developed a row where we want a role because we wanted to keep track of who these first speakers are. We wanted to acknowledge them and make them feel special. We didn't know then that we would be using that list today to identify the speakers. Um, and I'm proud to say my parents are both Cherokee first language speakers and they received both their vaccinations now. But what that tells me is when tribes are given the tools and the resources they need 
to address COVID at the local level within their tribal nations, they are in the best position to try to tackle this pandemic. But we also are in a position to handle uniquely what makes us Cherokee, the cultural aspect of it. And so in a lot of our signage here, it's in Cherokee and English. And we just make sure that our citizens have the tools that they need and that they know that we're uh, uniquely at tackling this issue because culturally, um, you know, we are, are about community. Thank you so much for that. So I'd like to come back at the end, Kimberly, to, to some of the issues you raised. I mean, the issues around community, self-determination, local efforts, you know, trusted experts, but also a, a clear kind of ethical obligation to those around you who are not part of that smaller local community. Um, and it seems to me that, you know, the model of the Cherokee Nation offers a model, you know, in microcosm for, for all of us. Um, so I'd, I'd like to come back to that as we wrap up and, and as we discuss a, a talk in a group. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary Kay, I want to come to you next. Um, so SEIU represents a wide range of frontline health workers from nurses to home health aides. There's uh, more than 2 million members and uh, your organization and you in particular have really championed safety, pay and respect for these health workers, these frontline workers, these essential workers. Um, so I wanted to ask you, um, you know, the pandemic has been devastating psychically in the workplace for your this constituency in particular. Um, do you think there has been any silver lining? Do do we have you know have the seven p.m. rounds of applause for our neighbors and colleagues? That you know, if there has there been a, a newfound value for essential workers, and and if not, how do we how do we get there? Um, and if so, how do we amplify and and ensure that? Um, the, the, our appreciation for the workforce does not wane um, uh, when the pandemic does. Thank you so much, Dr. Nelson. Uh, yes, there have been silver linings. Yes, I think there's a newfound understanding about the role of essential workers all across the U.S. economy. As you said, the healthcare workers in hospitals, nursing homes, and home and community-based settings have been on the front lines of caring for people infected and dying uh, in record numbers from this pandemic. But I think we heard from both Dr. Jones and Dr. LeBird that essential workers are anybody who hasn't been had the ability to stay home and work. Uh, and that's all across retail, uh, restaurants, hospitality, airports, uh, public service workers who had to go in to process unemployment checks and then stay overnight in the office uh, because no prep had been done and no PPE was ready as massive unemployment happened. But I do want to tell you the story of one of our home care leaders. She cares for the elderly and people with disabilities. She has uh, six consumers she cares for in Washington State. Her name's Brittany Williams. She's a third gen generation home care provider. And she was invited to a roundtable by President-elect Biden when he wanted to listen to the voices of healthcare workers on the front lines of this crisis. And uh, she expressed her incredible pride in the work that she did. She went to dollar stores to get her own PPE at the beginning of the pandemic. And that was before her union was able to bargain for PPE distribution widely uh, in Washington state. And we've made several breakthroughs on that front. Um, but she talked to President-elect Biden about the systemic racism and sexism that has blocked 2 million home care providers, primarily black, brown, and immigrant women in our nation, from being able to live with dignity and have a living wage. Many of these jobs are sub-minimum wage jobs or minimum wage jobs in many states across the country. It's the fastest growing job in the US economy. And it's vitally important right now to keep elders safe at home and to expand community-based settings for elders needing to get out of congregate settings in nursing homes. And she talked about her hope in the Biden caregiving plan that's gonna invest billions of dollars to expand home and community-based work for elders, but also to raise wages and create se uh, secure benefits for the first time. Uh, in this job that was racially excluded in the 30s from any of the rights and benefits uh, 
uh, that working people enjoy. So paid sick leave is not a guarantee in this work. And it hasn't been won in either the CARES Act or the most recent action of Congress. And we're looking forward um, to making that one of the first actions in the next uh, Congress. She also talked about the way in which she's tried to keep herself and her family safe. But I think you know from how you introduce me, we've um, experienced far too much loss. Um, essential workers, because of the lack of federal coordination, because of what Kimberly just talked about in terms of the lack of distribution of personal protective equipment, were hit hardest by death and infection. And we've mourned the loss of thousands of SEIU members uh, who were on the front lines of this pandemic trying to care for and feed people. But the silver lining, as you asked me, Dr. Nelson, is there's incredible resilience in communities of color all across this nation who have joined together and through their union have bargained what they need in terms of time off, personal protective equipment. And now we are joining together to demand respect us, protect us, pay us, and to insist on vaccine distribution that is transparent, that is equitable, and that is culturally competent in the way that we've heard from Dr. LeBird and Kimberly. Um, we're bargaining that with some of our employers. We're intervening in places where we have members who are refusing to take the vaccine because of historical trauma and use of experimentation in these communities. And um, we look forward to continuing political and public advocacy uh, to insist that uh, no essential workers should die from lack of equipment. We want the vaccination to be another aspect of health and safety for the essential workforce, but not a replacement for masks, socially distancing, providing the tools and resources that essential workers need to care for themselves, to care for their patients and the people they serve and to protect their families. And we've experienced situation after situation in the past 11 months where when working people join together through their union or with their community partners and demand respect, um, we are able to win it. In Virginia, $75 million was awarded to all the home care providers in, in Virginia uh, to make sure they had the gloves, the disinfectant, and the protocols needed to stay safe and continue to do uh, their jobs. And there's story after story of gains. I think in the next Congress and with the next president, what we hope to do is nationalize those gains and not just make it um, accessible to the people that are able to gather together and advocate for themselves because the 140 million poor and low wealth people in this nation deserve uh, equal access to dignity and respect. And we're gonna be a part with our partners and the cross sectoral engagement that Dr. LeBird talked about from the CDC. We see our union and essential workers all across uh, the US, Canada and Puerto Rico as a part of that cross sectoral engagement to crush the virus through education and advocacy and to return not to the normal that we had before because normal didn't work for us as the report that we're talking about suggests. There were deep racial and uh, gender inequalities written into that normal. And this moment we think creates the opportunity for us to eliminate those inequities as Dr. Um, Jones called us to. Uh, we can. This is the moment where we can use government investment to uproot systemic racism and create new systems and structures that care for people and allow every essential worker to have a living wage and the ability to care for themselves and their family. Thank you very much for that, Mary Kay. I mean, what an extraordinary mobilization um, very quickly around really even redefining what we think about as workplace rights and workers' rights, um, and uh, that I think will have a, a longstanding uh, impact and look forward to hearing about more future victories um, uh, along the way. Thank you.
So we're going to turn to David um, before we open up briefly for a little bit of group conversation. David, we're been, we've been talking about Forgive Us very much about the U.S. context, um, uh, but your extraordinary work, um, you know, covers the globe indeed. And if we want to talk about vulnerable populations and the, the sort of, uh, you know, exacerbating way, ways in which COVID-19 exacerbates inequality, we need look no further than the migrant and refugee populations that are such a you know significant part of your constituency, um, and indeed one could sort of do a slice of uh, you know sort of you know variable refugees as a variable and sort of slice that across the globe and just see you know tremendous um, data about inequality from that category of social experience alone. So I wanted to um, ask you to talk a little bit about what you're seeing in your organization with regard to COVID for these constituencies uh, in particular. And if there's any particular, I, I think, insight that you would offer to uh, particularly some you know, policymakers here that are joining us in the audience about um, what these experiences, I think, tell us that we need to do to mitigate not just the disease, um, but its impact. I believe you're muted, yeah. Uh, I was on mute. Uh, thanks very much indeed for including the International Rescue Committee in this extraordinary panel. It's been absolutely fascinating to listen to the very, very distinguished female leaders that you've uh, had. Uh, the International Rescue Committee is a global humanitarian charity uh, that works across the arc of crisis from war zones in Syria or Somalia or Afghanistan conflict zones uh, through the refugee experience in neighboring states, refugee transit routes, and then we're the largest refugee resettlement agency in the United States. Uh, the international experience of COVID is precisely a mirror of what happens in the United States. It exposes inequalities in a very structural and uh, deadly uh, way. Uh, we recently published our emergency watch list for 2021. It covers 20 uh, of the most uh, dangerous countries in the world, the countries that ha are most exposed to humanitarian crisis. Uh, those 20 countries are just 10% of the world's population, but they're 88% of the people in humanitarian need around the world. And the three drivers of humanitarian crisis are conflict, uh, they are climate change, and they are COVID. Uh, the United Nations says that COVID is going to drive between 80 and 150 million uh, people into extreme uh, poverty, that means living on less than $1.90 a day. Uh, and uh, they've also uh, prefigured that four countries uh, are on the verge of uh, famine, uh, including Yemen, which is the world's largest humanitarian catastrophe, 18 million people uh, in humanitarian crisis. And I can well understand that people uh, in the United States who are thinking about your own problems think that you've got a big enough challenge on your plate without thinking beyond your own borders. But the truth about COVID is that it shows that you have to think globally uh, beyond your own borders as well as within your own borders. And so if you're asking for one message to policymakers today, it's that the US needs to be engaged, not just as a matter of having a big heart, but also as a matter of self-interest. Uh, the, the warning really is that unless the new administration is willing to take on global engagement on health issues, never mind other issues, uh, it's not going to be able to fulfill its own aspirations internally because there won't be a return even to a reformed normal. I think uh, Mary Kay is absolutely right to say that uh, we shouldn't be talking about going back to normal because normal wasn't good enough in all sorts of ways. Uh, but uh, the global uh, scene is absolutely critical to any new normality that's gonna be created uh, here. You can think that about the uh, conflict and uh, refugee and migrant affected populations south of your border, uh, but also more, more globally. And so the plea of the International Rescue Committee is that the United States recognizes not just its power internationally, uh, but in what will we understand will be a, a rejoining of the global, of the World Health Organization and various other international bodies under the new administration, but also a recognition that it's in your interests to tackle humanitarian crises because they don't stay in the countries that they start in. Uh, they end up in a connected world affecting everyone. And that's certainly the lesson of COVID. And it's one that we think applies in other areas too. Thank you for that. And, and so what, I guess I wanted to ask you to talk about a little bit from the, the, the perspective of the, the refugee or the migrant. So what is that experience like if you are um, 
you know, suffering with COVID or trying to avoid suffering from COVID? Where do you go? Who do you turn to? What is, you know, quarantine clearly is likely impossible, or if it is, it um, looks a bit like surveillance or policing. So I wanted you to like maybe talk from the bottom up a bit, if you don't mind. Well, three billion people around the world have no access to running water in their own home. And since the first rule of COVID is to wash your hands as much as possible, you can immediately see the uh, dangers. However, it's also important to say that when, because of the peculiarities of this disease, so many of the communities that we serve uh, don't have their own homes, they don't work in offices, they're in a peculiar way um, protected from some of the ways in which COVID has been uh, spread. Uh, the testing is very poor, so you're very unlikely to get a test if you're a refugee or a, a migrant to know whether or not you've got uh, COVID. And obviously the health facilities are far, far weaker. That means that people are particularly reliant on their own uh, family and their own social circle for protection or for care. And obviously there's a very important gender dimension to this. Uh, women are 70% of the global care workforce. Uh, they're particularly exposed to domestic violence and intimate partner violence during an emergency. And so our focus has been on protecting our staff and continuing to run our services because obviously they are a lifeline uh, for people who are on the run, for people who are fleeing conflict, of whom there are record numbers, 80 million people now uh, around the world, more than 1% of the global population, are either refugees or internally displaced, and they depend ever more on the services that we provide. Thank you for that. So we're going to wrap up, but I wanted to bring everybody um, up to our virtual stage um, uh, as we're uh, wrapping up, and, and just to pose one last question for you, um, which, which, is, is, which is this. I mean, what are your... Um, what would be your sort of um, best advice um, and perhaps also your highest hope for um, how political change can um, change uh, the COVID-19 situation and the experiences of the communities that you come from and, and represent and speak to and for? Um, let's start with you, um, uh, Dr. Leibert, if you don't mind. Certainly, yeah. First of all, I am absolutely heartened um, by the conversation that we've had today and knowing that you all are where you are doing the work that you're doing. Um, I think it's been said um, how we are much more connected to each other than we think we are, and that even across borders and across international borders, I think if we can stay in touch with that reality, that's one thing that will, um, that will carry us forward. Um, I also um, think that we have an opportunity, again, to, to work more closely together. But I do believe that ultimately, um, community capacity, community engagement, the interests of the people um, who are most impacted, I think we have to have uh, relationships with those um, policymakers, faith-based institutions, educators, uh, business sectors, all who are having a day-to-day -day impact on the community, we need to continue to stay connected to them and be able to infuse public health uh, knowledge and wisdom and strategies into that work. Thank you very much, Dr. Leibard. Um, Kimberly, I'll come to you with the humility that we need to be following you, not asking you for, uh, you, you know, for you're doing what we need to be doing. So. Um, Please. Thank you. I, I think, and I'm going to speak from a tribal perspective, um, because tribal governments, you know, are, are in fact governments. And so the point of me saying that is tribes need to have direct access to funding and to the uh, resources that it needs in order to take care of its citizens. We know coming into the new administration that you know, President Biden has committed to having an executive order on PPE, sort of a made in the USA kind of thing in response to the difficulties it was. You know, as a direct result of the challenges we faced, we have a PPE manufacturing um, business that we're standing up in February of this, of this year. My hope is that in any executive order, in any congressional enactments regarding COVID responses, um, that tribes are expressly included. I used to say to my colleagues when I worked in the Obama White House, if tribes are not expressly mentioned, then we can assume there's an omission of direct participation in whatever policies we're trying to unveil. I think that's absolutely critical. The other piece of this is I wanna give great kudos to our public health people here at Cherokee Nation. We're collecting our data 
and you know, and readings, the documents that were provided to us for this event today, um, you know, I realize as we more studies are done internationally and nationally on how the COVID response was. Don't perfect, don't, you know, my hope is that tribes are included in some of those studies. You know, I don't know ultimately what a report will say about the United States response to COVID, right? We kind of know it's gonna be critical, but we also know weaved into the United States are some governments, tribal governments that are doing the best that they can with limited resources. The other thing I wanna say too is don't forget about rural healthcare. You know, most tribes are located in rural impoverished communities with very little access to the health clinics and hospitals that they need. And so increased efforts for more doctors and nurses. We do at Cherokee Nation have a partnership with the Oklahoma State University College of Osteopathic Medicine, the very first accredited medical school on tribal land. And that's a direct response to us needing to grow our own doctors. And mentioned earlier was that of the entire population of physicians, only 1% are Native American. Our current class of medical students at our medical school, 20% are Native American. And so having that investment, having stable funding. While we were facing this pandemic, we were also facing a government shutdown that was potentially gonna happen on December 11th. And we had to fight like crazy to make sure that government didn't shut down while we we're in the midst of a pandemic. And so creating certainty, um, having you know congressional leaders uh, not pass, um, continue to fund the government on continuing resolutions that there be proper order um, as well. Um, and so those are some of the, some of the things that I, wanted to say. Thank you very much, Kimberly. Uh, Mayor Kay, we'll turn to you next. I think the advice is that we continue to work across sectors uh, to get the U.S. government uh, to act in ways that this panel uh, has talked about and to make sure that in addition to government, um, employers, businesses are also uh, joining in the cross-sectoral response. So we really think we have to end racial inequity in healthcare, especially in black and brown communities. We need to establish a $15 national federal minimum wage and the ability of workers to join together in a union to bargain a better life. We've appreciated essential workers, but we are not valuing them. And there are concrete steps we can take. Um, and then the third thing is what this panel is focused on in terms of the crushing the virus. And I agree that we need to rejoin the global um, solidarity in doing it together because our union, our members speak 80 different languages. Um, they're very concerned about their family and friends uh, back home. And they're equally concerned about vaccine distribution in every corner of the world as they are about in the United States. And we consider our union and our members part of the solution where we can do education and advocacy in every community of color with trusted community partners uh, to help uh, get to equitable uh, distribution. And I just see incredible promise um, thanks to the report you made that we are understanding the systemic roots to problems that have surfaced because of the pandemic and the resulting uh, economic crisis, and that this is our opportunity uh, to, to right historic wrongs once and for all. Thank you very much. Uh, David, the last word to you, if you will. My uh, hope and advice is that this is a teachable moment for the world, that inequality is not just immoral, it's inefficient, and that in an interconnected world, we depend on each other. And if that message comes out, then there can be some good out of what has been the most horrendous wake-up call for the world. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, so many takeaways. I mean, one of them is that uh, most of the world is vulnerable. Um, so uh, all of us are vulnerable and, um, and uh, you know, not that, you know, that we should sort of really keep that in mind. And uh, certainly it's clear that as we're seeking solutions, that it is these kind of concentric and overlapping circles of community, you know, small to big and in between um, that, that really sort of point the way in some regard. Um, so thank you all so much, Mary Kay, Kimberly, Kamara, David and Leandris for spending time with us. Today, I mean, many of you do are doing life-saving work every day, and for taking the time to to um, help share with others uh, that perspective.
And I want to thank also the audience for, for joining us uh, here this afternoon. Thank you. So we're grateful as well Thank to you. Smith Futures. Um, and coming up next, we're going to hear some closing remarks from uh, day one of, which has already been an extraordinary day, from Wendy Schmidt, who is co-founder of uh, Smith Futures. And Wendy's going to say a bit about some of the opportunities ahead uh, to build a healthier and more equitable world. Thank you all very much. <laughs>